Oh, this is great. Stand by. Okay. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right. I believe we're live. I'm getting a message from our producer, Catherine, that we're live. Thank you, everyone, for attending this special NaNoWriMo webcast. I'm Grant Faulkner. I'm executive director of National Novel Writing Month. And welcome to our special Double Up Donation Weekend. Um, I want to thank everyone so much for your generosity. We are two thirds of, our, of the way to our $150,000 goal for the weekend, which is tremendous. Thank you for clapping, Rachel. Yeah, um, yeah and it's, it's, I'm always so touched by the generosity of the NaNoWriMo community. And, you know, $150,000, this is our biggest fundraising campaign of the year. It's super important. And it's, it's super important because we are a tiny nonprofit and we're serving a world of writers. I mean, we have a staff of 10 and a $1.3 million budget, and we serve 500,000 people every year. And that includes 100,000 kids and teens who write in our Young Writers Program, and we support 10,000 classrooms through that. These are little known NaNoWriMo things, actually, but, but most people don't know this, but we also support a library program called Come Write In, and we serve nearly 1,200 libraries. And we have nearly 1,000 volunteers around the world. Most years, they are organizing in-person writing events. This year, they're, of course, doing everything virtually. We hope they'll be back to organizing in-person events uh, next year. Shannon actually organized, she is a librarian, and, and she organizes events herself at the UC um, Berkeley Library. So um, a lot, we have a lot of reach with a very tiny budget. So thank you for donating. And um, tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow's the culmination of everything. And I want to say we've got a a bunch of great prizes every day, but tomorrow we've got a special grand prize, an Airbnb writing retreat, $1,500 um, cool. coupon up to you. So you can probably spend five, six, seven days um, anywhere in, in the world that there are Airbnbs. So, so tune in for that. And then tomorrow is going to be, I think it's going to be the biggest writing day in the history of the world. And I say this, there, it's at, least, at least on record, we, our goal is 140 million words. Uh, written on the first day of NaNoWriMo. And people have already started in uh, Australia and Tokyo and Bangkok, and we'll start in the United States tomorrow. Uh, so yeah, we're shooting for big things tomorrow and throughout the month. And we'll have more activities like this webcast tomorrow. So thank you for tuning in and keep tuning in. And with that, I am going to introduce, the, the reason this occasion is so special, we have this event called, the series called Nano Litmo. Most people do not know about it because it's in, mainly in the Bay Area or only in the Bay Area. I'm going to let Rachel and Shannon tell more about it because they are the hosts of NanoLitmo and we feel so fortunate today that we can broadcast NanoLitmo to the world. So, and with our special guest, Walter Mosley, who they will also introduce. So Shannon, who I said, she is a longtime NanoRimo volunteer and supporter of NanoRimo.org. This will be her 13th year and she hosts Come Right In Sessions at UC Berkeley Library, as I mentioned, where she received her BA in History. And she is the head of Interlibrary Lending and Duplication Services in Doe Library. Shannon is a published indie poet and currently pursuing publication of her contemporary multicultural romance novels. She's a proud Oakland native, native but loves traveling the world following Pearl Jam and other bands around on tour with her chosen family. So thanks for joining us, Shannon. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah. And then Rachel Heron, uh, she is the internationally best-selling author of more than two dozen books. I say I should say that Rachel's basically the hardest working writer I know. Um, <laughs> that includes uh, thriller <laughs> novels under R.H. Heron, mainstream fiction, feminist romance, memoir, and nonfiction about writing. She received her MFA in writing from Mills College, Oakland, and she teaches writing extension workshops at both UC Berkeley and Stanford. She's a proud member of the NaNoWriMo Writer, Writers Board, and she's a New Zealand citizen as well as an American. Welcome, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you, Grant, for all of that. Yeah, and before we, we turn it over to Rachel, Shannon, and Walter, I want to invite everyone who um, is watching to put your questions in, in, the, in the chat. So we will pull from those questions and ask Walter later in the webcast, but Rachel and Shannon are going to talk to him now. So Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for the intro, yeah. Grant. Well, we are so, so, so excited to be here with Walter Mosley today. Um, I'm going to have the supreme honor of talking a little bit about NanoLitmo and how it came to be. So um, I was introduced to NanoRimo in 2006, and I've done it every year since then. Uh, I was firmly stopped in my writing career. I wasn't writing. 
MFA program had basically killed my writing spirit. Uh, NaNoWriMo got me out of it. It became that 2006 very first novel became my first book ever sold to HarperCollins. And since then, like you said, I've written more than a couple dozen and I have dedicated whole books to NaNoWriMo. One of my supreme privileges um, above all is being able to give back financially to NaNoWriMo, which I will say I did yesterday, Grant. I did not do it tomorrow because I thought as a member of the writer's board, I probably can't win the Airbnb. <laughs> so I just might as well give yesterday and I did that. I think that's the coolest gift thing ever. But how NaNoLitmo came about was I, I believe it was Grant and Shannon and I just sitting around and talking about this idea that NaNoWriMo is a literary community. And what do literary communities have? They have readings, they have literary events where we get to be together and talking about our writing. And so we started doing it regionally here in the Bay Area where NaNoWriMo was started. We started holding these in a cafe. Um, we've done them in a couple cafes now mm -hmm. uh, over about the last four years, I believe we've done these. And so this year we were kind of brokenhearted when you know, the pandemic kept us all inside. And then we realized that we could take NaNoWriMo on the, NaNoLitmo on the road and we could have this literary series talking about two writers about writing. We could have it in front of everybody. So we are very, very, very pleased to welcome you to the virtual cafe. Um, welcome to Walter Mosley. We are going to be asking him some interesting questions and hearing his answers about his writing life. So welcome to Nano Litmo. And now I'll turn it over to Shannon Monroe. Hello, well, I can't say it any better than uh, Rachel, but I'm honored to be here with everybody and um, just blessed to be here with Mr. Mosley. Um, I will read bio and then we'll move on to questions. Mm. Uh, Walter Mosley is one of the most versatile and admire writers in America. He is the author of more than 60 critically acclaimed books that cover a wide range of ideas, genres, and forms, including fiction, political monographs, writing guides, including elements of fiction, a memoir in paintings, and a young adult novel called 47. His work has been translated into 25 languages. Concerned by the lack of diversity in all levels of publishing, Mr. Mosley established the Publishing Certificate Program with the City of University, New York, to bring together book professionals and students hailing from a wide range of racial, ethnic, and economic communities for courses, internships, and job opportunities. In 2013, Mr. Mosley was inducted into the New York Writers Hall of Fame and is the winner of numerous awards, including the O. Henry Award, the Mystery Writers of America's Grand Master Award, a Grammy, several NAACP Image Awards, and Penn America's Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2020, he was named the recipient of the Robert Kirsch Award for Lifetime Achievement from Los Angeles Times Festival of Books. Welcome, Mr. Mosley. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. And you are with us from Santa Monica today, look at, yes, looking yes. at the beach. Can you actually see the beach from the place you are? Yeah, yeah, I look out the window. I have this great windows. I look, I see the Pacific Ocean. There's, and there's nothing bigger in the world. So I love it, you know. So you're living the life. I That's am, but I'm ancient, you know, so. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> That's not true. Speaking about, so let's jump into these questions. We're going to throw a bunch of maybe yeah. perhaps not rapid fire. Please take your time as in answering those. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have some simple ones like this first one I'm gonna queue up and then maybe some broader ones. Uh, but what brings you the most joy in writing now? <laughs> what brings me the most joy in writing is what's always brought me the most joy in writing. It's, I love writing. It's really great. I love doing it. I do it every morning, three hours a day. I sit down, I'm, I'm working, I'm writing something. You know, I try to stay write on the same thing every day until that thing is finished. Sometimes that's not possible. I have to switch it around. But I just I just love writing. You know, I got up this morning. Uh, I, I just wrote a, an article for the Nation magazine uh, about, you know, how I think that, you know, the, the, the left, which is possibly, you know, winning the, the election, uh, has their language is really off. You know, and that, you know, we need to include people because we all have the same problem. So I've been, you know, trying to figure out that, you know, uh, I, I won, I've won another award recently 
uh, the, the, the Lifetime Achievement Medal for uh, the National Book Awards for the contribution to literature. Congratulations. So been, wow, congratulations. Thank you. And I've been trying to write that. And, you know, the, the hardest thing to write is the shortest things, right? I mean, poems mm -hmm. are the hardest thing, right? And this is, I'm going to give a speech you know, of acceptance, and it's going to be four minutes long. It took me six weeks to write my four-minute speech. And, <laughs> uh, and it was, but it was really so much fun. You know, every day, you know, I'm reading it, I'm reading it. It's not working. It's not working. It's not working. It's kind of working. It's not working again. You know, and, and so I'm, this is answering your question. I know I'm taking too long, but. Um, writing every day is, is, is the answer for a writer. You know, if you don't love it, I mean, I know Joseph Conrad hated writing and he did some great <laughs> novels, but um, if you want to be a happy writer, it, it, it's, you know, nothing, nothing other than your writing is going to make you happy. And I would love to, I know other people have this on their mind. When you say you write every day, are you talking yes. Saturday, Sunday, and Christmas and Easter? Oh, every day, 365 days a year, you know. Um, One or two days I always miss, you know, I'm sick or I'm on a plane or something because yeah. I do it in the morning. But um, yeah, 365 days a year, every day. There are no holidays from, you know, it's not a job, you know. It's yeah. not, uh, you know, in Marx's term, alienation. It's actually yeah. something you're doing for yourself. Gorgeous. Incredible. All right, I'm up next. Um, in your uh, book this year, you write your novel. You state that if the reader follows your advice and, and that you don't promise a masterpiece, just a durable first novel of a certain length, which I love. Um, with that said, do you think you can actually be taught great writing? Or how does one get to the masterpiece level? Well, you know, I don't think anyone could be taught great writing. I don't think anyone ever has. Uh, that's not to say there's not a great novel in every person. The question is, is whether or not you get there, you know, whether or not you free yourself up enough, whether or not you, you make a deep enough commitment to saying, you know, what you think, what you feel that the movement in the world is. Um, I'm not sure that writing a great novel should be the, the goal, goal of any of any person, uh, I think that you know we're writing books, you know, and 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 those books are part of a great dialogue, like that gigantic library behind you. There's it's a that represents this fantastically large dialogue between uh, uh, millions of millions of people today, but also past generations and also future generations. And the the great thing about writing is to be part of that dialogue. You know, right. you know, right. be a footnote in somebody's, you know, writing some papers, you know, in a, a hundred years from now saying, and then so and so and so and so from Berkeley wrote, wrote this and this later became that, you know, I mean, you know, that's it. It's just, we're all small parts of this gigantic thing. That's, that's what libraries are. They're all these tiny little books, you know, that all come together for a, a dialogue of, of an entire species. Right. Thank you. And then we get to have this dialogue with you and yes. you are having this dialogue with all of these writers watching on YouTube, That's which great. is amazing. I think it's so wonderful yeah. that, that I've always loved this program. I know, I've never really understood it, but it didn't matter that I didn't understand it. I thought, oh, <laughs> great, I was going to write a novel in a month. That's really cool. You, you know? <laughs> I think you already embody NaNoWriMo. Yeah. You really do. Exactly. You show up and you work and then you show up the next day and you work some more. Yes, yes. So what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Hmm, that's like a good question. <laughs> you know, I, I think that it's always external things. I mean, you know, the, the idea, I think that in, 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 it, it's really easy to talk about it in, in the early moments of writing. When I first started writing, you know, I wasn't getting published, you know, or if I, maybe I got a couple of little short stories here and there, but I, I, you know, I wasn't getting money. I had to, you know, I had to make money. And, you know, and, you know, and in, in, in the modern world, you know, which is completely dominated by capitalism, no matter what your, no matter what you, you know, everybody says your politics are, it's, it's dominated by, you know, by the means of production, you making things, you making money. And so you have to make a decision. Is it the most important thing to make money or is it the most important thing to make art? Uh, the th my, my decision was I would wake up at five o'clock every morning. I was a computer programmer in, in, in uh, New York and Manhattan. I wake up at five o'clock and I write from five o'clock to till uh, in the morning till eight o'clock in the morning. And then I would go to work. 
that three hours in the morning, that was my, that was my life. And then the rest of the day was, you know, was my living. And, um, and I think that that, you know, that's the hardest thing, you know, when you have to um, give up how productive you might be in those later hours to make the work in, in, in the early hours. And I did, you know, I said, I put, I'm doing my best work from five to eight, and then I'm doing the rest of my work from eight until five. How long did you do both of those things? I don't know, maybe, maybe four or five years. I was, you know, I started, came to writing very late. It's like 34, 35, 34, maybe. And, um, and I was writing and, you know, and, and going, going to work. And, and um, I was, I studied writing. I took a class, uh, a graduate class at, at City College, uh, very much against the, the private universities and how much they charge students. But, um, but, but, you know, City College wasn't all that expensive. And I, and, and I, I was uh, going there and, um, and it was so great because one of my teachers was Edna O'Brien, who I think is one of the greatest write, living writers in the English language. Wow. Great. Oh you would write a short story. Edna would, Edna would, um, she would take it, go, take it home and study it and, and, and make all these comparisons to these great writers. And then she would read it in that incredible Irish brogue of hers. <laughs> and I, mean, I would just sit there and go, oh my God. You know, and one day uh, I had written these three chapters uh, of something and uh, Edna said, Walter, write a novel. Just like that. And I did. I went out. It, I didn't take a month. It took me six weeks. But I wrote a novel in six weeks. And later on, that novel was published. And wow. I was so, you know, it was so moving to me. I mean, you know, just to, you know, to be, to be, you know, to have that as my, um, you know, I mean, the reason, to, you know, to, to be in a writer's, you know, workshop or a writer's room or work with other writers is because most people in America don't really care a lot about writing. They don't really know a lot about it. And so when you're with people who know about it, it's great. And, you know, somebody like Edna, who I thought was, you know, perfection, um, it was really wonderful. I can't even imagine her telling you to go write a novel. That's, that's gorgeous. That's amazing. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yes. oh my God. Yeah. What a great image. Yeah, well, that speaks to the sort of the global community of NaNoWriMo as well, in terms of the, the, the goal of being with people, even though we're not physically together this year, you know, or even people that you communicate with in previous years in across the world, we're, we're connected online through the NaNoWriMo website, through the forum, through the chat rooms, Discord, anywhere. Um, so that's amazing. Um, well, I guess speaking of... Uh, following up with you, just what you just mentioned. Um, can you share with us how you feel or if you feel any difference between writing short versus writing long, longer stories? Well, I mean, I, when, it, when it comes to writing, you know, Ian Forster in, his, in, a, in that, his wonderful book, Aspects of the Novel, uh, says a novel is 50,000 words, more or less, of spongy prose. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> It's so perfect because a novel, in my understanding, and I do write in many different forms, is the easiest form. Because, you know, listen, if you have a character, a, a woman walks into a room and she's wearing a red dress. In a novel, it doesn't matter. It's a red dress. Okay, fine. That was your aesthetic for that line and that chapter at that moment. But if it's a short story, that red, red dress better mean something important to that story. If you mention it's red, it better mean something that it's red. And if it's a poem, it has to mean eight different things. And if it's a play, <laughs> it not only has to mean things in language, it also has to mean things of, of what you're seeing. You know, and so, um, you know, I mean, writing a, a novel, you know, so I mean, writing a, another way to look at it, it's like a, a novel is like a mountain. And you know, you might be far away from the mountain and looking at it or a little closer, a little closer or climbing the mountain. It's your, your experiences of it are different, but it's this gigantic experience that's right there. Uh, a short story is like a, an island, but there's a mountain under that island, but you don't see it. You just see, you know, so everything has to come together in that tiny little, you know, plot of land, you know, above the water. And so, yeah, I think that when you're writing a short story, you're real, it's a real challenge to make every word fit. You know, it's like a, you know, it's not so spongy, it's crystalline. And if you're gonna write a poem, it's gonna be diamond-like, you know? And so, yeah, so, I mean, that's the answer to the question. 
from from my from my my part of the world. That is a beautiful answer. Now, Inc- <laughs> yes, incredible. Thinking about the mountains and the islands. Yes. Mm-hmm. All right. So when you turned eighteen, on yeah. your eighteenth birthday, mm-hmm. what did you think you would be doing on October thirty first, twenty twenty? Now you know I wasn't thinking about October. You know, I was thinking about. <laughs> I was I was I was in California, in LA. I was thinking, wow, in in a few weeks I'll be able to hitchhike up the coast and be in Haight Ashbury. That's what I was <laughs> uh, back then. So I know I'm, I know that I never, you know, being a Californian, I you know I never really worry about. I never really worry about where I'm going. When I studied writing, I studied writing so I could write. I was wanting to be able to write a story, a short story, beginning, middle, and end. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I, I love. And uh, the idea that later on that I would get published and I would, you know, start, you know, you know, making a life out of being a writer, people would be calling me up, you know, from the, you know, from somewhere and, and, and asking me questions. I, I wasn't even thinking about that. It was, it was, it was simply um, the, the joy of, of life. And I think that that's, you know, that's something I'm, I've always been feeling. And you know, it's it's a it's a it's a great thing to you know to identify yourself with what you do with your mind and your hands. And you're that you're the bicoastal. You are California born and bred, and you have the New York. You have a little New York accent now, Mr. Mosley. I hope you know, you know that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's fantastic. It's like, and when I'm in New York, they say I have a little LA accent. But you know. <laughs> I moved to to the East Coast a long time ago, and I and I've and I've lived there. I've lived in New York for the last 30, 35 years. Um, I'm from here. I'm from Los Angeles, and I I don't know. I mean, uh, it, 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 I I have been really lucky in my life, you know, to to have success uh, in something that I love to do. Like if I'm wake up in the morning you know, and I'm writing in the morning and, you know, and really, I don't even think about it. Some things I write and I'm just writing them and nobody cares. Like this article for the nation, you know, if they pay me $83, I'll be lucky. Right. Um, But at the same time, I'm writing a a, a script, you know, based on a novel that maybe I'm going to do with Sam Jackson, you know, and, you know, I'm writing that with the same intensity, but, you know, I get paid for that one. I mean, that's, you know, which means I can, you know, keep on writing, which is good. Um, and, you know, I mean, life is, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm really happy and, and I realize how lucky I am. And I think that one of the big things for writers is that, you know, and why I always say that, you know, you have to be happy about what you're doing. Because if you're thinking about where that's going to bring you tomorrow, it's, it's actually going to, that's going to hinder you mm-hmm. in the long run. Yeah. yeah. I would like to um, mention everybody listening, if you would like to put questions in the chat for, again, remind you, you can put questions in the chat and we will be bringing those questions in in a little while. But right now it is Shannon's turn for another question. (laughs) Thank you. Um, In your follow-up work, Elements of Fiction, uh, you state that the act of creating fiction is to make something from nothing, which I think you kind of touched on a little bit, and that the blank page is the writer's friend. Can you share a little bit more about that? As in the NaNoWriMo community, we kind of have folks that sort of self-identify as the plotter or a pantser, where you write from the seat of your pants without thinking ahead too much, or sort of hybrid authors. Um, can you share a little bit about how you approach your stories, whether you plot a lot ahead of time or if you're more of the... You know, I do, I do everything, you know, if, if sometimes I've like, you know, signed a contract that I'm going to write a book that I, I had a good thought about, you know, let's say like I, the book I wrote, uh, Debbie doesn't do it anymore. I, I, I made that statement and I went, wow, that would be a really good book, you know, <laughs> so, so the statement and I made it into a novel. Um, and so, uh, but I sold the novel before. And so I, you know, I had a kind of a limit. So I did some plotting. Or uh, the the, the uh, uh, literary novel I wrote, John Woman. Um, I worked on it for twenty years, and I couldn't finish it. And one day I sat down and I said, "You know, Walter, you should write a plot, and then you could at least follow that." And I went, "Okay," and I did, I did that. And you know, and and that's you know, I, I do it. It's usually like you know, I have a deadline, so I want to I want to meet it. But very often I just start writing. 
I mean, Devil in a Blue Dress, uh, Gone Fishing, uh, many of the books that I do, I just start writing them. I just said, well, let's see what happens if I, you know, I write this sentence and I write that sentence and wow, this is really interesting, you know? And so I think that you can, you can come from any point of view. I, I think that you need to be, you know, it's kind of like if you were a boxer, you know, you usually do one kind of thing, but you get into a ring with somebody who like presents a whole different set of problems. Well, you can't do what you usually do if you have a set of problems in front of you. So you have to be able to, you know, to change and to, and to, and to feel it. You know, it's, it's, it's more like water than it is like stone, you know? Which goes right into our next question, which is, right. can you share, well, first of all, did you ever imagine that your novels would be made into films or TV series? Uh, did you no. hope? Did no, you get a no. dream? So can you share the biggest difference between writing novels and writing screenplays or scripts? Well, there's so many differences that, you know, I mean, one, they're the same thing. They're words. You put words yeah. down in order to have a certain kind of effect. Seems like a different uh, boxing ring, though, with using that analogy still. Well, it's very different uh, because uh, I, yeah, I was talking, I'm working on a, 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 a miniseries right now with uh, the director Taylor Hackford. He did Ray and an officer and a gentleman and all these other things, a director. And, um, you know, we were talking about it. And, 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 and one of the things that you, that you come out with is that uh, film is almost always completely collaborative. There's a director, there's a, a DP, there are the people who design the set, uh, there, there's the, the physicality of the world that you're shooting in. There's an actor, you know, who, you know, is definitely going to be different than if it was another actor, you know, all of these things. And you have to be able to flow with that. You know, when you're writing a novel, it's mostly you. And at some point or another, the, the, the editor can say, you need to change this. And you can just say, listen, man, fuck you. I ain't doing that. I'm not changing <laughs> this. And, um, you know, and so that's one, you know, one, the biggest difference, I think, is, is, is the collaboration. The other thing is, of course, uh, the something out of nothing. Something out of nothing means I have a piece of paper and a pencil. I'm writing my novel. That's how much it costs me. Whatever it costs me to get some paper and a pencil, that's how much the novel is going to cost me. <clears throat> Anything you're doing in film is going to cost millions of dollars. So when somebody comes in and says, uh, I'm sorry, but you know, we're not gonna let our main character kiss this other person because it's just unacceptable. Uh, you have to say yes, or you're gonna get fired because that's the, the way it is. When you write a novel, your main character can kiss whoever you want. You know, whatever you're gonna say, I, I need this kiss, I need it, you know, and you can make it happen. But in, in, in film, because it's collaborative and because it's so expensive, uh, you have to make a decision based on uh, other circumstances. And I mean, it's partially true in novels, but not nearly as much. Perfect. It's amazing. I know, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, NaNoWriMo participants that are thinking about their books moving forward to film or even writing, doing screenplays during the- Don't day. think about it, don't think about it. Don't think about <laughs> it. Like every, almost every book that gets published, it gets option. I mean, somebody reasons, somebody wants to do it and they give this, I'm gonna give you $4,000 and I got this deal for the next year and then I could do another 4,000 for another year. And they're gonna get somebody right. And the minute you sell it to them, it's theirs. It's no longer yours. It's theirs. And if all of a sudden, like I wrote this, you know, uh, the black detective, Easy Rollins, they say, well, we like that, but couldn't he be a white detective? You know, <laughs> now, I wouldn't like that. But once I sell it to them, you know, they're going to be able to do that. Um, it's and so, you know, if you don't want, if you don't want to have the trouble, don't sell it to them. I know at, at some point, Sue Grafton, who used to be uh, a TV writer, refused to sell her books to, to, to film because she didn't want anybody messing with her work. Right. Well, speaking of um, Easy Rollins, um, um, just the next question was about like, what are your thoughts on the current, like sort of diversity, own voices, Black Voices Matter movement in publishing right now? Do you think there's a change, a legitimate change happening in the publishing industry for Black heroes, Black protagonists, you know, Black authors, um, writing community? I know I'm talking to the entire world and maybe some other part of the world will, will enjoy this, you know, uh, 
but but you have to you have to know that in, in this country is is kind of awash with racism. And I'm not like talking about like, you know, I'm saying, well, white people think all this. I don't even believe in the existence of white people, but I, even if I did, I wouldn't say they do. Everybody, you know, kind of lives in, in, in racism uh, here. We have identities, we have cultures, we have supposed races. Um, people who don't get money from the government don't have to work with people they don't want to work with. And so if you're in publishing, you know, well, you know, you're kind of a feat, you're kind of like, you know, uh, Ivy League, you're kind of this, you're kind of that, you hire your people. You're not, you know, you're not going out there and, and the only reason that you would change it is because uh, somebody, uh, 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 you know, the, the uh, Tanahasi coach writes a book that's going to sell 4 million copies. Well, you want some of that money. So you publish Tanahasi coach. Right now, a lot of people from a lot of different you know, backgrounds and races are getting published because of that. At some point, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the wave can change and, the, and people might start thinking that if, if you seem racist, we're no longer gonna do business with you. So that might impact people, but it, it's the bottom line that impacts business, not you know, them trying to be nice people. Um, you know, I, I write books, people buy those books. Uh, I have some, you know, some power behind it. So people, you know, they pay attention to me, but I know that the minute, you know, I'm not selling books, that's it. They, they won't be paying attention to me. And I've had it happen. I mean, I know it like from experience. Thank you for speaking to it too. And thank yes, you for the work you. that you do. Yes, absolutely. Within that. Just to go back, we've got about two more questions and then we're going to open it up to questions okay. from the watchers, the people watching us. Um, you said in this year you write your novel, you said, of all writing, the discipline in poetry is the most demanding. Yeah. We, have, we mentioned that before. And you also said in the, on the next page that you can't write a passable poem. How does the idea of poetry inform your writing? Poetry is, is the basis of all writing and, and, and probably religion and probably love and probably hatred. You know, I mean, it, it's like it, poetry is where it all starts, you know, it, and you might speak that poem and you might sing it, but it, mm. poetry is where, where it all starts. And poetry te teaches you everything. It teaches you how to how to how to rhyme. It teaches you about metaphor. It teaches you about simile. It teaches you about choosing the right word. It teaches you about sound. It teaches you about the music of language and how it moves. It teaches you about uh, a word choice. A word uh, uh, when you when you repeat a word. When you when you you make sure you don't repeat a word. Everything. All of those questions you ask on every word you're writing when you write a poem. If you learn the craft of, po of a poet, writing like that, your writing is gonna be beautiful. And if you don't, if you just say, well, I'm just, well, you know, I'm just gonna have him say what he thinks. He says, no, that's not true. You gotta make that, you gotta weigh the way he, he you explain you know, how he's gonna say something and then what he says and then how that impacts uh, uh, your, 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 your story, your, your characters. All of that has to be working in order for it to be as beautiful as it can be. And a lot of prose writers don't know that. They say, well, I'll just write it down. I said, no, 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 you're not gonna just write it down. It, you, you, have to, you have to choose every word, you know? Which is why very often I read my novels out loud into a tape recorder um, because I wanna hear what it sounds like. And once you hear it, you know, that you really know, oh, that doesn't sound good. You know? And do you play that back for yourself when you record it? Oh, oh, that's beautiful. I just took a poetry class this month and it, I am finally learning that poetry is not something I needed to leave behind when I was 16 years old. And it's, I'm very glad to ask you that question. And, and Shannon. You don't have to be like a great poet either. I mean, you just have to understand what it is. Yeah. You know. That's wonderful. Shannon's got the last question I think from us. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, just a last question from us and then we'll open it up. Um, any uh, words of writing wisdom for the uh, rhymos that are embarking on their 30 day endeavor? Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, you know, the, the, the most important thing about writing 
uh, that that you that you tell that I tell people is that you write every day. And so I, I'm going to make a try to say something here because you know I know that it's this is a big rush. You got to write your novel. You know it's going to be fifty thousand words. You got thirty days. You got to write fifteen hundred words a day, and you got to get you know. Okay. Walter, I hate to interrupt you, but we lost, lost your face, you. and we would love to see your face. Huh. If it's something that maybe you pushed. I don't know. Let's see. Huh. I. So we can hear you, but. I, I, it's really interesting. I don't, there, there it is. I see that it's, it's dark. Oh, I see. Ah, there <laughs> you did it. There okay. Go. Now please tell Yay. us. About <laughs> how to oh yeah. So yeah. I think <laughs> have, let's, let's say one part of your writing is the writing. And the other part of your writing is the unconscious. So if you're doing this thing, uh, writing a novel in 30 days, if you could write like maybe eight hours and then put it away and let whatever you've done simmer for the next 16 hours and then write again, uh, if indeed you're writing fast enough during those eight hours, I think that that would be the best possible thing because you'll be making discoveries when you, as you take the break. You know, and that's and that's what I think would be more important. I mean, maybe people are already doing that, maybe they're not. But I think that the time that you're not writing, if you're writing every day, uh, is just as important as the time that you are writing. That's incredible. I think you called it in in the elements of fiction discovery mode. Is that right? I don't remember actually. I have to go look. <laughs> I think a lot of NaNoWriMo is the discovery mode, really. Yeah grasping and holding on to the discovery mode. Thank you, Mr. Mosley, right. for answering our question. Thank questions. you so much. Grant is gonna come in here and uh, throw some at you from the from the crowds. Yeah, I've been, I've been dis de describing my uh, first draft, rough draft for NaNoWriMo as the discovery draft of late. Yeah. Um, I think that re-characterizes it uh, for me um, and really helps me uh, in terms of the exploratory stuff. And man, Walter, um, I, I, if you want, I, you're the type of speaker that I could ask you a question and, and I feel totally comfortable if you take a half an hour ask, answering. <laughs> um, so, so, so just, yes. just, just go. Uh, but we've got a, a great, uh, wonderful questions from, from the attendees, the watchers. Uh, Lanise B, and this is a big question. What advice do you have for new writers seeking to find their own voice? The ever elusive voice. The good one. Um, well, I mean, that that's a very like you know difficult question. Uh, I, I deal with it in in, in depth in, in uh, elements of fiction. Now, yeah, elements of fiction. But um, I think you the, the the thing that will make you make or break you as a writer is if you can edit your own work. Now, editing is a, seems a very kind of structural thing. But I think that also, if you can listen to what you've said, if you can come back at your writing in different ways, like the one suggestion I made is, you know, recording your, your, what you've written and then listening to it. Uh, it might be reading it out loud to other people who, you know, you have different, you know, different kind of relationships with. Like even, you know, like there's some people, you know, if you read something out loud to them, you know what they're thinking while you're reading it, and but you wouldn't have thought of it unless you were reading it to them. I think that that it, it it's it's not an easy thing uh, to do, but and and but one of the things is is that if uh, discovering your voice is a long process, and you can write two or three novels or four or five novels and still not be all the way to understanding what your voice is. So get as far as you can, try as hard as you can, read as closely as you can, uh, but don't put any pressure on yourself to, to get to any particular goals until you get there. Yeah, I feel like I'm always looking for my voice and I've been writing for decades. Oh, well, uh, your voice, voice changes. Yeah, your voice changes. Your voice changes over time, um, but you know, I find, and this is really interesting to me, that, you know, my first novel that was published, Devil in a Blue Dress, uh, if I read a, a book today, technically it's a better book than Devil in a Blue Dress. But it's not necessarily a better novel. The other thing is, is that 
there's it's not a question of technique or anything like that. It, it's it's you being, you know, honest and to some degree effusive uh, with the story that you're telling. And um, you know, I mean, listen, uh, what was it Sister Carrie? Sister Carrie's written terribly, but it's a great novel. I mean, <laughs> it's just like you look at it. And go, Oh, this is a great novel. How come it was written so bad? You know, I hate it that I want to read it. You know, so anyway, you know, I th I think that um, being able to listen to yourself, which is the same thing as saying being able to edit yourself, that's 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 where the voice uh, gets you know built. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. I love that. Um, Anne Lipscomb, you know. Uh, Many different writers, of course, write during National Novel Writing Month, uh, best-selling novelists, right? But also a lot of uh, very new writers and many people are embarking on their very first novel and sometimes their very first writing. And mm -hmm. so Anne Lipscomb, uh, she asks, any advice for a newbie to writing? What, what would you say to somebody who's just absolutely new to writing and gonna do National Novel Writing Month this month? Well, you know, I, I, I wouldn't give any advice unless you know, they start to run into trouble. You know, if you start to, to run into trouble, then, you know, you'd say, well, you know, you know, what is the trouble and, you know, how, how can we deal with that? And I don't know what, what, the, what those things would be. Uh, the, the idea of just writing is so wonderful. And writing in this, in this way, I think is extremely wonderful. And so, uh, you know, just tell your story, just keep telling your story. Don't, don't stop, don't, don't, you know, let, let the little, you know, editorial bird on your shoulder tell you, oh, that's wrong, this is wrong, you know. Don't worry about spelling, don't worry about grammar, no, don't worry about, um, you know, uh, that, you know, you, you should, you know, go boil some potatoes. Don't worry about that, you know, just, you know, worry about the writing doing the writing and and this limit of 30 days is so great because as you're doing the writing it it, it you know it'll tell you no no you can't do that because you got to finish this book in these in this amount of time and i think that the way that this this uh you know this uh, practice is, is being presented uh is is the way it is actually exactly what you should be doing you know, and it does, you know, at the end, you know, you'll have a, you'll have a novel, you know, and you'll look at it and it, it'll, and, and you start to work and, and, and chisel it, and, you know, as time goes by. We're, we're going to take that answer and use it in all of our promotional materials now. Uh, <laughs> that promotely <laughs> says. Yeah, that, that was really great. Uh, I'm curious, though, you, you mentioned um, uh, the inner editor, as, as we call um, mm -hmm. this this force of, of critique. And I'm just curious um, if you have wrangled with your inner editor and if you have, what advice would you give to someone to banish? You mentioned the banishing of the inner editor. That's sometimes easier said than done. So how, how do you how do you manage that? Yeah, that's um I mean that's it's it's a really it's a, it's a really difficult problem. And sometimes, I mean, I say different things. Sometimes I go, listen, I'm gonna put this away and I'm gonna do something else. Because whatever it is writing this thing, I, you know, I, I seem to, you know, I, I, my, you know, my super ego is like going crazy working on, on this thing, you know? Uh, so I'm gonna write something else. Sometimes I just say, come on, let, let's, let's get through it. Let's figure it out. And so I go th through different things. I you know, read it out loud. I read it to somebody over the phone. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I uh, uh, go back and I, and I rewrite something, you know? I, you know it, you know, it, it's a thing. It, it's hard. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to say to somebody, "Well, here's," you know, because a lot of people you know, come to you and say, "Well, what are the rules?" And I say, yeah, "The rule is that you write the novel. How you write the novel, you know, can be any way you want." It, it, going back to my boxing, you know, uh, analogy, you know, you you have to be, you know, you have to it, come up to your uh, foe if it, indeed you have a foe, and uh, and match that person. Uh, in 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 their in their aggressiveness, um, and you know, and I and I don't know the. I mean, if I was talking to somebody and they were and they were telling me this is the problem I'm having, I would be able to talk about that. In general, I can say you have to do it, and if you realize that you're not ready to do something, then change it around and do something else. Great. Um, this, this next question is kind of a big existential life question. Uh, mm -hmm. It's from Tiffany Griffith, and she says, this might sound pessimistic. I don't mean for it to, 
but is there a time when someone should give up on trying to be a writer? I'm trying to understand if I'm dealing with usual writer challenges. What do you think of that one? I don't know of a time when somebody should give it up. You know, I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I, you know, because I make the comparison to sex, you know. Is there a time when you should, you know, just, you know, you're not, you're just no good at it, you should give up having sex? My answer is no. You know, you know, it's like you are who you are and you're in this world and fun, you know, let's, you know, just, you know, you have to do it. You know, was there a time that I should give up eating? Well, no. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, there's not a hierarchy in writing. There really isn't. I know people think there are. So, well, uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway is blah, 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 you know, uh, Faulkner is blah, 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 you know, well, but I don't care about Faulkner and Hemingway. I, I care. I'm trying to write this story, you know, and as long as you're trying to write the story and you want to write the story, then you should be writing it. You know, it doesn't matter that, you know, what somebody else says or more likely what you think somebody else says, you're just, you're doing your work. This is, this, is, this, is, this is important. Writing a novel is important. Novels are important. It's one of the few things that we create in this life that causes us to think. It's one of the few things, moments of art that we create and we pass on to somebody else. And that person completely reinterprets everything you do because it's all in language. It's about a, a, a sensual world, but it's all in language. And so, um, you're going to learn from writing your novel. Other people are going to learn from reading your novel, from hearing your novel. So no, I don't think there's ever a time that you should give up. I mean, if you don't want to write anymore, then you stop writing. That's fine. But uh, there's no time limit on that. There's not a, somebody saying, well, wait a second, you only have like, you know, four more minutes before you <laughs> finish this novel. So no, 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 no. You can write on that forever. You can write your whole life on it. I mean, uh, uh, Whitman, you know, uh, worked on Leaves of Grass his whole life. There's 11 different versions of the, that book of poems, you know, and they're very different. But, you know, I mean, Leaves of Grass is, you know, that's our legacy for poetry. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, I've, I've known, especially when I was younger, I knew many writers who said, I have to write a novel or publish a novel by the time I'm 30. You know, yeah. as if it was all going to end after 30. And um, I really appreciate your answer because I hope you talked a lot of people out of quitting writing. No, no, nobody should ever framework. should. You know, I always tell people, the only reason that you won't be published is if you stop writing. <laughs> it's like, no. it's true. Some people won't get published anyway. But, but the thing is, is the only thing definite for you not getting published is if you stop writing. Yeah. And I'm actually looking at the comments in the chat and uh, you are helping people, Walter, just by saying these things. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Rachel, because I'm looking at questions I pulled out of chat and I'm looking at them in a Word doc. So I'll go back to get more questions soon. Um, let's see. Um, a retro world um, at Walt asks, um, are there things you ever feel you miss out on in life by writing so frequently? And how do you reconcile that? I've missed out on a lot of afternoon hikes, I know. <laughs> you know, I mean, I only write three hours a day. So, I mean, how much could that take out of my life? You know, it's like, I, 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 don't, I don't really feel that I'm being uh, limited uh, by that. You know, I know there's a lot of writers who say they write 12 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. I don't know how they do that. I mean, you know, how do you, you know, you gotta, how do you make dinner? I mean, you, you must only eat, you know, boiled hot dogs, you know, and you know, that, that would be awful. But, you know, I personally, I write three hours a day. It's usually in the morning. And, you know, when I'm finished writing, you know, most people are just waking up and, you know, then there's a day out there in front of me. I mean, right now we have this, you know, you know worldwide pandemic, but, uh, as a rule, you know, I can go out, I can see people, I can do things, I can, you know, go to a museum, I can, you know, I talk to friends. Um, no, I don't, I don't think that, you know, I don't think that, I think that writing every day, you know, it's, it's like, you know, we live in an odd, you know, techno culture where um, there, you know, it's, 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 it's broken up on the ism, the capitalism where, you know, you have to write, but you know, work, but in that work, you're giving away your labor, you know, um, and 
you know, and, and life, you know, becomes smaller and smaller. But I look at it much more as, you know, in a, a so-called primitive culture where everybody, you know, they have a job, they do that job every day, you know, we, you know whether you're taking care of the crops or you're fishing or, or, or you're taking care of children or, or, or you're, uh, you know, standing, you know, I, I saw this one thing, you know, where these people were like scarecrows, but, but they were living people. And so they just stood on this platform. And if animals came, they, you know, they threw rocks at the animal to, you know, to make them go away. We all have a job and we're doing it. And, and that doing is, gonna, is making us and our world a better place. So yeah, that's, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. yeah, writing doesn't take away from life. It actually adds to life. Exactly. That's how you reconcile it. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a question here. Uh, a lot of times, Nanorama writers they they love the rough drafting process. They're galvanized by the month, and then the question is, how does one revise this this big discovery draft? This perhaps it's a messy. So uh, Cynthia uh, Beatty asks, can you talk about your revision process? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it in in a in, in a way, and I'll an, but in a way that I answer another question. People often ask ask me, when do I know that the novel is finished? And I said, well, you know, I write a rough draft, and then I I read through it, and you know, I I see what I I find things that I was trying to do that I didn't know, and I keep working at it and changing things and making things work, you know, and then I do a draft, and then I do another draft, and do another draft, I do a draft, I see things wrong, I fix them, I do another draft, I see things wrong, and I fix them, and I do another draft, and I see things wrong, and when I say a draft, I read through the books and I see the problems and I tr try to make the changes. It might take a week, it might take a day, it, it depends. Um, finally, you know, in the 20th, 25th pass through the novel, I read it, I see some problems, I don't know how to fix them, and so it's time to send it to the editor and get it published. You know, it's, it's not going to be perfect. There isn't a perfect novel out there. I haven't read it anyway. Um, and uh, you just keep going through it, you know, and you and you keep making changes. You might go through and say, well, this, I'm only going to make change the words that I, I left out of the sentences. And this one, I'm only going to worry uh, about dialogue. And this one, I'm only going to worry about this character and what they're doing, you know. And this one, I'm just going to worry about the plot because the plot's not working. You, you make, you know, you have different goals for yourself, but at some point or another, you have the goals, but you don't have the, the skill to fix it. Okay, fine. That's a finished book. Put it out there and start working on the next one. The next one will be better. Yeah, I've heard uh, some writers say that they will tinker and change until they know that they'll, they'll look at one of the changes they're going to make and they're not sure that it really improves the novel at all. And that's it, when they know it's finished. That's yeah. That's one way you start saying, "Uh oh, yeah, I I I did this and I did that," but it's it's you know six and one, half a dozen of the other, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's great advice. Um, Rob Wynn Anderson, you know, you mentioned that you work on different projects. You obviously write in different forums. Um, how does working on different projects? How do you how do you how does that juggling work? Do they do they inform each other? Do you feel like you're distracted by just different projects or? Or do you kind of get put on put on the blinders and just kind of focus on one at a time? I do focus on one at a time. However, it, let's say I'm writing novel A. I'm writing novel A, writing novel A, you know, going through it, making the changes, doing the things. Finally, I don't know what, you know, don't know how to fix the problem. So I sent it to my editor. That's on a Tuesday. I, I write every day. So on Wednesday, I have to start writing something else. So I start writing novel B. So I'm writing on novel B, working on it, you know, I get about halfway through it and novel A comes back to me. And they say, okay, here's our editing. Here's our changes. Go through it, blah, blah, blah. So I put B away. I work on A for a while. Uh, I, I, I fix it as well as I can. I send it back in. I go back to B. And I work on it until I finish it. I send that in to somebody. And then I'm starting to work on, you know, uh, book C. It might not be a novel, maybe it's something else, but I'm working on C. So A and B are out there and C I'm working on. But any one of them, I work on it until there's, it's, it's a natural stopping point. And then, you know, and then I move to the next thing, to the next thing. So it's like a really slow juggling process. On any week or two weeks or three weeks in a row, I'm only working on one project. But there are these, these other things out there waiting to come back to me, and and that's you know that's you know that's the way that I keep working every day. And in that, if you work every day, I think that it helps your other work. But I don't know how it does. I just think that it does because I'm going deeper mm -hmm. and deeper in myself every time I go you know go to the well to you know get more water. Yeah. 
Um, you know, big premise of NaNoWriMo is just helping people get over the obstacles that present themselves. Many obstacles present themselves for every writer, right? Uh, the One of the most uh, frequently cited is writer's block. And, and I find that a lot of writers don't really believe in writer's block. So I'm curious, do you believe in it? It doesn't sound like you have it in any way, but do you believe in it? And if, if you um, if you believe in it, how would you advise someone to get over it? All right. To begin with, it's not an it. Like writer's block could be anything from psychosis uh, uh, to the fact that you you know you're you're you don't get enough vitamin B twelve. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like it's like the 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 idea could be a, a you know a mild psychological thing like some kind of uh, issue you have with your mother and you're writing about that issue, but you haven't connected it to your mother. You know what I mean? It, it could be that. It could just be the fact that, you know, that, that you're nervous about something or that you're tired or that you're working too hard on something else. Or it could be that you actually need to be in therapy or you need to be, you know, you have to have some kind of, you know, a uh, 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 chemical uh, ingestion in order to you know, calm you down and allow you to think. Uh, every experience of writer's block, I think, is unique, and you have, and and I, therefore I can't sit and try to say, okay, here's the answer. You know, if somebody is, uh, you know, I had a, a friend, a, a very good, uh, well-known poet, and uh, she was talking to me saying she couldn't write a, a, a series of poems because they were about her daughters, uh, and uh, she didn't think it was fair to be writing these poems about her daughters. And I said, are you sending them out to get published? And she goes, no. I said, well. Are they, do they know the password to your computer? <laughs> and she said, no. And I said, so you could just write them. It doesn't matter. You know, when you get to the end, you can decide whether you're going to publish it or not. You know, and she went, oh, right. That's what I tell people. And I go, uh-huh. And, and she went back and wrote the poems. You know, so there, she was experiencing a kind of writer's block. Mm -hmm. And there was an answer. And then she went ahead and wrote, wrote the poems. You know, um, but if you know, if it, like I said, if it's some more uh, a very kind of deep uh, a, a psychological you know problem, uh, you know I wouldn't come to somebody you know who's you know really you know extremely neurotic and and not able to do a certain thing, and I wouldn't say oh well, you, you know you, there's no such thing as that you you know you're just making that up. I wouldn't say it because I don't know. I'm going to ask one more question from our community. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to ask each of you just to prepare you. Can you give? Uh, we'll finish with everybody giving one your your favorite, your best tip, your best advice for people as they set out to write novels uh, tomorrow, unless they're in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so this one's for you, uh, Walter from Paulette Livers. Uh, you write both mystery and literary fiction. Is there a difference in your approach, formerly or structurally, for each? When I write in different genres. I like to pay attention to the genre. So if I'm writing about science, writing a science fiction book, if I'm writing a mystery novel, if I'm writing an erotic novel, there's certain kinds of things that I kind of have to do. It, it's really clear with mysteries because mystery, you got to address the plot every second or third page. So you're addressing the plot. But beyond that, there's no difference. It's, mm -hmm. it's you're writing about character, you're writing about place, you're writing about language. There's a, a lot of things that people don't know is that you're writing about language. The people are, are learning from the way things are said, uh, uh, either in, you know, in, in, in the, the prose part or the dialogue part. Uh, and, uh, and so, that, so that's, that's, the, that's the thing, that, 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 that's how, how I, I see it, that, um, that there's no difference uh, except in some technical moments. So what we well, you're writing a romance, somebody better be in love. You know, it's <laughs> like, you know, if I wrote a whole romance and nobody's in love, then I've actually failed, you know, at my project. Mm -hmm. Great. That's a good, good, good advice. And, uh, I'm going to do go around the room here, starting with Rachel. What is your best advice for writers as I set out on a month of literary abandon? My best advice is to write what excites you. And this is purely from my own standpoint that I always get to points where I'm bored. And you know what, if I'm <laughs> bored, I just stop writing. You don't have to finish that scene. Pick up the next thing that is fascinating and you will figure out the connections later. Just proceed with 
Wild Abandon. Wild Abandon, all right. Shannon, you're up next. Oh dear. Pearl Jam playlist. <laughs> well, that was actually one thing I had written down earlier as Mr. Mosley was talking about, uh, about his uh, process was um, definitely uh, start with a soundtrack, get your Excel spreadsheet or your Google Doc or Google spreadsheet and uh, make a soundtrack for, for your story. Um, music definitely inspires me. So find something that will um, help you envision your, your scenes maybe. Um, another th uh, practical thing I learned was to um, to end up getting to 50k was to uh, just don't worry about any kind of like Mr. Moses was saying grammar or, or spelling or anything just write 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 um, and then also if you get stuck as a lot of rhymos do halfway through the month and you're worried that you'll never make it to 50 is um, maybe start with a different character and make them the, the main character and just follow that path and see mm. what happens. That's just great advice. And run mm -hmm. wild. Yeah, run wild. What about you, Grant? Oh, gosh, and I hadn't thought about it here. You know, I, I, I think I'm going to give a little bit of a, a, what you both said. I think, I think what happens to a lot of NaNoWriMo writers is that they, they're really excited at the beginning. And that first week, everything's going great. And, and it's the second and the third week where your novel gets tough. Your, the, your energy for your idea, your enthusiasm can run out when you start to hit, hit the wall a little bit. And I think too many people give up at that moment. You know, obstacles are usually invitations to go deeper and to find new parts of your story. And if you'll just hang in there, take a walk, you know, take a break, come back, but uh, keep exploring your story. I think and keep that notion of being playful with your story and exploring it and not putting too much pressure on yourself. Um, you know, just getting the words on the page and, and also sometimes um, people when they fall behind their word count targets, they think they can't catch up and so they, mm. they, they just quit, you know. And the premises of this month is to make creativity a priority and to write. And, and I've seen so many people <clears throat> make these crazy comebacks, you know, just because they kept writing. You know, and they might write 20,000 words in the last week or 30,000 words to catch up and make it to 50,000 words, or they might just write 25,000 words. And that's great too, you know? So, to, so, so celebrate yourself. I'm mean, 25,000 words is a huge amount to write in a month. Um, I like this, I tell this story often. I've had so many people apologize to me for only writing 10,000 word, words in November. And I like to stop and do the math and say, that's 120,000 words a year. Mm -hmm. that's two pretty good novels right there. So that's a lot to celebrate. So uh, just keep writing, really. How about you, Walter? What do you have for us? Well, you know, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, because, you know, of course, I mean, I always say the most, the only, the most important thing about writing is writing every day. Uh, so, okay, like you already got that. <laughs> Everybody's going to be writing every day. And I, and I, th and, and I, I think that, that the, what I would say to your people is, is different than if I was talking about writing in general, but if, if what I would say to, to the people writing in this next month is just uh, believe in the process. Say, I'm going to write every day. Well, you were happy writing today. Were you sad writing today? Were, did, did, were you interested writing today? Even if you were bored writing today, that's okay. But you're, you're, you're just going to write every day. And at the end of this time, uh, you're going to have, you know, reach that goal. Uh, and the reason that that's okay is because the first draft is not even the novel. The first draft is before you start writing the novel. Mm -hmm. So, like, so if if you if you write your fifteen hundred words a day from between now and, and thirty days from now, that's that's fine. That's 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 perfect. Uh, and uh, everything good will come from then. So you don't. It doesn't really matter. I don't think. And nothing else matters. You just have to get from word one to the last word, whatever, wherever it is, 25,000, 45,000, 45,000, 192,000. It doesn't really matter. You just have to, you know, just keep writing until you get to that. And then starting on the 31st day or the 32nd, depending on how many days are in the month, um, you just, um, you start rereading it. And that's where the novel uh, is going to occur. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Novels emerge over numerous drafts. And yeah. that's why I appreciate it when you said you do 20 to 25 revisions, perhaps. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So thank you so much, every everybody. Thank you, Rachel, Shannon, and Walter. This has been really yeah, wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate you, your time. I appreciate your wisdom. And uh, thank you to everybody for tuning in and thank you for donating. Uh, we have reached the $100,000 mark with your donations. So we're you know, over two thirds or two thirds of the way there. $150,000 is our goal to reach tomorrow. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have some fantastic prizes planned throughout the day, including a special uh, $1,500 coupon from Airbnb to design your own special writing retreat and take, take all these things we talked about and put them into action. So thanks again, everybody. Tune in tomorrow. We've got other webcasts and activities planned as well. So thanks again, Thank everybody. Thank you, Walter. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Wonderful. Enjoy. Good luck, Pleasure. everybody. Thank you.